Hi, this is Julie. If the kind of conversations you're finding here on the podcast resonate with you, I'd love for you to join a growing community in the Private Mother's Quest Facebook group. You'll get more personal reflections from me, invitations to our free weekly Epic Life check-ins, and the opportunity to meet some amazing like-minded mothers on a quest. Visit mothersquest.com forward slash community to join. Hi, and welcome to Mother's Quest, a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high-energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best mom! self. Mom! <laughs> I'll be right there. Where was I? In the months leading up to a big milestone birthday, I decided it was time to stop sidelining my dreams and realize that I'm the hero of my own journey. I knew I didn't want to do it alone, so I created this podcast to learn from other moms on their own quest, so their words of wisdom and lessons learned could help light the way for mine. I created this podcast for myself. Come along with me, and you'll find some treasures of your own. Hello, and welcome to this episode number 40 of the Mother's Quest podcast with someone who's grown up alongside me as my friend since I was five years old, Rachel Winter. The street ends to my beef fry in the best friend's necklace charm we bought in elementary school. Rachel knows me better in some ways than I know myself. Most know her as the Oscar-nominated producer for the movie Dallas Buyers Club and the life and creative partner of Terrence Winter, the Emmy award-winning screenwriter for the HBO show Sopranos, and the Oscar-nominated screenwriter for the movie Wolf of Wall Street. She's also a mom to two children, Max and Simone, a devoted daughter, a champion to her friends, and at her core, a storyteller, a quality expressed beautifully by Rachel Steinman, who presents this week's dedication. Hey, everyone. What Julie and I have in common is our massive love for the awesome Rachel Winter. Rachel's a Wonder Woman of sorts who, as busy as she is, juggling 24 projects, producing, directing, and taking care of her family, always makes time for her friends. Rachel's always loved stories and the storytellers who bring them to life. One of my favorite memories and now images of Rach comes from when we were in college in the early 90s at UC Santa Barbara. I'd never seen anyone watch an episode of Cheers with such delight. She sat inches from the screen, her expression changing with every line. She was completely transported to a bar in Boston. To most, TV and movies are entertainment, but to Rach, they're worlds she escapes into. And so after I toiled to write an unexpected memoir, born after discovering my grandfather's unfinished manuscript 24 years after he jumped from his Beverly Hills high-rise, Rach was the first person I had to give it to. It wasn't easy handing over something so personal, because what if she hated it? When she saw the raw art in my story and became my cheerleader, I not only felt relieved, I felt honored. Thank you, Rach, for believing in me. It means the world. I'm honored to dedicate this episode to my mama, Lori Callen Schwent, a woman who was recently diagnosed as a bipolar, but likely was manic depressive her whole life. Mom witnessed a mother who was in and out of an asylum only to discover her mother's lifeless body when she was just 14 years old. Of course, my mom fought being labeled bipolar. She didn't want to be like both her parents who tragically committed suicide. How does one get over being orphaned because of mental illness? I was set on a path of self-discovery when I chose to become my grandfather's ghostwriter and write my own story. Through new lenses, I saw mood disorders as an actual disease, one you can't just snap out of. Whereas I used to be shamed by mom's inappropriate mania, I now see what my daughters do in their beloved and crazy Grammy. I see a woman full of life whose eccentricities I now celebrate. But I'll always worry about mom, my daughters, and myself. Because mental illness can be inherited and it can be cruel. Mom, thank you for never becoming hardened when you so easily could have. You're my hero for believing love, never material, is the answer. It's why you'd give your last dollar to help anyone in need. It's why you'd rescue any stray. It's why you help so many with kind words of encouragement, sharing in their pain so they aren't alone. Thank you for fighting your mental illness battle with therapy and a cocktail of medications, when I know sometimes you'd prefer not to. But mostly, thank you for loving me so fiercely. I love you so much. 
Thank you, Rachel, for the honesty about your family's battle with mental illness, for this beautiful dedication to your mother, and for your reflection about our mutual friend. I'm not surprised to learn that you've entrusted Rachel to help you bring your family's memoir to the movie screen because her ability to find, commit to, and bring forward stories that need to be told is her zone of genius and calling. In our conversation, Rachel and I explore the people and experiences that shaped her as a child, why she asked for a divorce when she realized she wasn't living authentically to her vision, and how she has since stepped forward as the heroine of her journey in the movie version of her life. We talk about her latest movie starring Rosario Dawson, Crystal, which took 15 years to make, and how because of how long it took to produce, it resulted in a deep friendship with William H. Macy, who directed and acted in the movie, and Felicity Huffman, Bill's real-life wife, who also played his wife in this movie. I appreciated Rachel's honesty as we delved into how the epic guideposts show up in her life how she's learned to slow down and focus when she's with her children, the upcoming movie project she's most excited about, how she takes care of herself with strong boundaries and a morning workout ritual after drop-off, and how she shows up for the people she loves in her life. Rachel gave us all a challenge to seek out an out-of-the-box movie experience, like Crystal if it's playing near us, and take a moment to look around and even introduce ourselves to someone sitting near us, so that we realize we are all connected and that stories bring us together. I'm grateful that I get to live my life alongside my friend Rachel, and that I had this time to delve deep into what it's really like for her to live the authentic movie version of her epic life. I hope you leave this conversation inspired to find the powerful stories that need to be told, to make time for conversations like these with your closest friends and to hold true to the vision you have for your life. I'm Julie Neal, and this is Mother's Quest. Rachel, my lifelong best friend. I'm so excited to have you on the Mother's Quest podcast. I am so excited to be doing this podcast. I feel like if our lifelong relationship somehow didn't get me onto the show. I mean, what's the value? (laughs) (laughs) I have to warn everybody listening that there's bound to be some laughter and some (laughs) inside jokes that we'll try to shine some light on. And we were saying before we pressed record that this episode is obviously, you know, different than some of my others because we know each other so well. And I didn't necessarily bring you on with a particular purpose in terms of something I'm seeking that I know that I want you to shine light on. And yet I know that by the time we get to the end of this conversation, something is going to become clear that I am meant to take away from this conversation and to work on in my own life. So I'm excited for that discovery process to figure out where we land. (laughs) Me too. First of all, congratulations. I know that yesterday you had the premiere of your latest film, which is called Crystal. And I saw some photos and it looked like you were having an amazing time. How are you feeling coming out of that experience? Oh, thank you so much. I'm a little bit in the post-premiere haze. Voice is a little scratchy from all the talking and sort of yelling over some small crowds and I feel really good about it. So produced the movie. It was a 15-year journey. I read the script for the first time in 2002. So I would say the short answer of how I'm feeling is, you know, at this point, it's not even bittersweet. It's just sweet to have run the race, to have had a beautiful evening with so many of the people who were involved, who worked hard, and I'm proud of the movie. You know, I feel really good about the movie. I feel like the movie is coming out at just the right time. And I know we'll talk more about it. So, yes, I had the pleasure of watching part of the movie. I couldn't make it to the whole screening when you were here at the film festival in San Jose. I came in during some really hysterical scenes. So I know there's a lot of lightness to it. And I had so much fun hanging out with you and Bill Macy afterwards and just getting a little glimpse into the dynamic and the relationship that the two of you have built, which really was possible because of how many years it took for you to create the movie. 
I love right. that, you know, these silver linings that, you know, Bill and Felicity have been, have become such a core part of your life. And, you know, some of your deepest relationships are with them. And that wouldn't have happened had not the film taken so long to create. That's exactly right. And I actually, there were a couple of interviews on the red carpet last night that spoke to that in terms of, you know, the independent film world is a complicated business. Yeah, I think the entire industry is complicated, but I guess just like any industry, but the cyclical nature of it, and certainly when it's a favorable part of the cycle toward independent film, the films can, they don't necessarily take as long to get done. This was in the lower part of the cycle and it did take a long time. And yes, during that time, we really built this relationship that started because of a script and they've become such close people, you know, important people in my life and my, you know, Terry, my husband. And yeah, it's really special to have shared it with them. Very happy for Bill because William H. Macy being such a, you know, an iconic part of my industry to be a part of celebrating something a little bit different for him since he directed the movie. So that was really fun as well. And then, you know, just having such a diverse cast, having the film be what it's about. It's just, again, it's really a timing thing. So we all were celebrating that as well. So we will definitely delve more into some of the themes of the movie and some of the lessons that you've taken away from the experience of creating that when we get into the epic guidepost. But first, the question I ask every guest at the beginning is to tell me a little bit about your childhood and the impact that your mother had in shaping you. It's a little ironic for me to <laughs> ask that since I have literally been by your side during your entire childhood. <laughs> you know, this isn't a question that I've really asked you. So I am curious if you were to put, you know, your childhood experience in a nutshell and highlight, you know, the impact that your mom has had on you, what you would say. Oh boy. Yeah. Why don't I, why don't you say what you think the impact my mom, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you could probably answer the question. So my mom, she's a great woman. I think she's always been a great woman and not because she, you know, went out and set the world on fire in the sense that has been a driving force for me to do, but because she has a personality, she has the view of the world. She has a voice. She's a smart person. She has a sense of grace about her. And I think that I've learned a lot from her. I think I am becoming her, whether I like it or not. I was in an antique store and I found this needlepoint pillow that I just had to buy. And the pillow says, mirror, mirror on the wall. I am my mother after all. Oh. And that, well, and you, Julie, you know that people think we look like twins. And so yeah. I have to say there is an extra layer to it when I have been at functions where there have been mostly my parents, friends, or relationships. And I have had somebody walk up to me and say, Judy. <laughs> and so at my age, I really hate that, by the way. <laughs> and she's so much older than me. But anyway, I think she's taught me a lot about life and a little bit more like what not to do. And the interesting thing is, she's not a risk taker. And so in a way, I think I have formed a lot of who I want to be and how I want to be based on who she isn't and who she wasn't. Mm. And she never laid it out for me like a cautionary tale, like, oh, well, don't do what I did and don't make the choices that I made. It was never presented in that way. But I don't know, you know, you spend your life in the same house with somebody, certainly easily the first 18 years, you know, it's guilt by association. So I will say, that I'm a bit of a pleaser and that has a lot to do with the family dynamic. So having an older brother who needed a little more attention, mm -hmm. who had some issues and then the, you know, some of the other personal stuff going on in the family that I you know, wasn't aware of at the time. 
I guess, probably a reaction to the way I grew up. I'm more of a pleaser and I have an impulse to try and make everything okay for the people around me. Mm. Okay. Lots of thoughts swirling. First of all, I need to say that your mother is a beautiful woman who looks so much younger than she is. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I agree with that. <laughs> yes. You know, it's interesting because you said at the beginning, I've never thought about this before, which is why I love making time for these kinds of reflective conversations about how in many ways you learned how to take risks in your life as a counterpoint to what you witnessed with your mother in her life. In terms of a strength that I see in you that I know can be challenging, but I think is also such a gift is that your mother is really clear, too, about what she likes and what she wants. Yes, yes. Well, wait, 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 wait. Actually, she's very clear about what she doesn't like. Ah. And I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, so she's infamous for, you know, we all kind of shudder if we have to buy her a gift. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I think, hasn't everybody officially given up? (laughs) But yeah, I do think that getting clear about what you want does also sometimes begin with being clear about what you don't want. And so maybe, you know, we are often like the further evolution of our mothers, the next version. And I think that you're clear about what you don't want. And you have also been really empowered to seek out more of what you do want in your life. And that's one of the things I really admire about you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. And I probably did look around growing up and I don't know that I realized how much I was clocking it, but it's so interesting. It really wasn't until my first marriage that I thought I did have to do a bit of trial by fire. Could I live a life that looked more like the one I grew up in well, was that not going to work for me? And unfortunately, I you know, hurt some people along the way figuring out that, no, I couldn't. What I came to call the backyard barbecue life, mm. which sounds you know, really silly now, but I think it had to do with the fact that the guy I had chosen who really fit in so perfectly into my family and into the world I had known, but it just wasn't enough. I knew it. And it wasn't about... The journey for me, the difficulty wasn't discovering that it wasn't enough. It was owning up to it. It was accepting that, oh, these were the choices. Like, okay, you know what you have to do. The question is, will you do it? Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. And I, you know, I was alongside you during that part of your life too. And I distinctly remember you saying... I feel like I'm living a life that is not mine. Like this is not the life I am meant to live. And, you know, many people could look to you and say, what are you talking about? Like, what are these ideas of grandeur that you have? But you (laughs) did, you did realize that there was a much bigger world that you envisioned your life to be. And you did, you were very courageous in, you know, moving out of a marriage that with somebody who you did love and care for and with, you know, all of the thoughts and potential judgments of family and other people around you. And again, I think this is one of those places and times when I really admire you or your vision about what you wanted. You knew what you wanted and you knew that you weren't living it. Well, and I appreciate that, you know, we're similar. It's hard to take compliment. We've talked about that too. (laughs) I don't know, that might just be a female thing, but I do appreciate it. And I do, I guess I realize and through conversation over time with more and more women, I suppose it is a little bit hard to do because the generality or the generalization you could make about women is that we do want to put it all together and bring everybody together. It's certainly not in the nature to rip it all apart, but I was hurting him and that helped get me out the door because I wasn't trying to have my cake and eat it too. But any sensitive person is going to suffer from somebody who's aware that they're living an inauthentic life alongside another person. (laughs) So it was really wrecking the whole thing for him too. 
and I just felt awful about that. So in a way it helped. And, but back to my mom for a moment, just to, and then we can move on to something else. But the low point in my relationship with her was she wasn't as supportive of me moving on from that first marriage the way she maybe should have been. And I think it was a little bit coming from her belief that, well, you stay, you stay, it's okay to settle. He's a really good person, you know, that kind of thing. And I remember it was sort of a pivotal time between the two of us. And what does she say now when she sees your life? (laughs) I think we're the pendulum sort of swung so far. (laughs) And I think she's very happy for me. She's very happy that I believed in myself and she's happy that I made the decisions that I made. And I certainly have given her to more grandchildren (laughs) as a result of the decisions. And I know, I think she recognizes, especially look right after last night, she was there and loved the movie and enjoyed it. And hanging out with Rosario Dawson and having good conversations <laughs> with, with William H. Macy. And I think she understands that I found my way. And yeah, I think she feels really good about where I ended up and got myself. So before we move on, when you look back on your childhood, what would you say was the core thing about that experience that shaped you? And I often like to ask people to share, you know, an epic snapshot moment from their life where you feel like, you know, things really slowed down or it really, you know, encapsulates everything about who you are or your path. What memories or moments come to your mind? We had a pretty regular kind of all-American upbringing. I remember being at the Jewish Community Center with you. I remember the warmth of being there. I remember feeling that was the true meaning of community. And we were so young, but it was so special. You looking back, you think how rare that is. I think in today's world, I think about those times. I think I've always been a sensitive kid. You know, when our friend Leslie cut her arm open at camp on that old jagged glass, which by the way, I still look back and I can't believe they let us run around those kinds of grounds. How dangerous (laughs) that whole place was. Do you remember how hysterical I got? I just, that, you know, our friend was in pain and had to go to the hospital. It was so traumatic. So I was aware that I was an overly sensitive child, which I have passed on to Max, my son, with apologies. And then I remember my dad. My dad was a very big influence. And I remember one Christmas, he was leaving the house on Christmas. We're Jewish. It didn't really matter. So, you know, he was leaving with a bunch of books. And I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going over to the jail to bring these books to some of the kids who, you know, because it's Christmas. And I just was very impacted by that, that, you know, the choices that he made in life and was making, you know, we're very much about other people who had less than we had. And my dad was a public defender for juveniles, a little to fill that in there. And he just, yeah, I don't know. I guess at a young age, I did have an awareness that even that felt like a story to tell. I remember that was a dramatic thing to do. And in talking to you earlier about this conversation, it's kind of occurred to me that I suppose from a young age, I felt like what's going to be the movie version of this life. And so I think, I feel like that is a bit of a theme. Yeah. Well, I think that is actually perfect segue to getting into living an epic life and the epic framework because you know mother's quest and this path that i've been on since i've launched it 
was a similar choice point for me about, you know, do I want to live my life and look back with some sense of regret? Or do I want to feel like I lived the epic version of my life, which, you know, could be the movie version of my life, but the one in which I also make the courageous choice to do what really feels like my vision. And I want to hear more from you. I do have a sense that you're living your epic life, your movie version of your life. How would you describe that today? So what is this epic version of your life? And what do you feel like you're most on a quest for in living it? Oh, that's a great question. You know, look, I struggle with balance. I think just like every mom, moms who work and moms who don't work, (laughs) I think it's a struggle to, once you have children, the cycle of life sort of states it's like a pay it forward kind of thing. Well, you brought these children into the world. You really need to give to them because so it goes, your mother gave to you and then it'll be their turn to give to their children and so on and so on. And so my most epic life would have me just being the queen of everything and getting that balance so right, where I'm on top of every single detail for the kids and, and then killing it at work. So, you know, but that's my, I feel like that's like an hourly journey. So, you know how I have the handwritten calendar, you know, I have my book where I write every single thing down. (laughs) I do. I don't know if I knew you did that. Was that inspired by my sister, Debbie, who used to write every detail of her day on her calendar before she went to bed? In those little teeny boxes before they had other kinds of calendars. Yes, I think it might have been. And so I'm a very visual person. And if I sort of don't see it in front of me, so, you know, I'm just a little bit old school. But I look at the combination of stuff written down. And it is everything from pick up Max's prescription at CVS to, you know, George Clooney meeting at 3 p.m. in Toluca <laughs> Lake. You know, and you're just like, okay, well. And so it's amazing. And I actually, I'm good about not taking that for granted. I do, I'm super challenged all day long, maybe a little bit too challenged, but I just don't want the wrong things to slip through the cracks. But, you know, that's a judgment. And I don't know, I should, I'm trying to work on taking out the judgment part of it because it's all important. I've made commitments all over the place and I need to keep those commitments. So sometimes, you know, the driving force isn't this amazing deep fire that burns within me. It's just, I want to be a decent person. I have made commitments to people and I simply need to carry them out. And and obviously the kids and Terry need to come first. So it's super challenging. So yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure that answered your question, but that's what's on my mind most of my life. Yeah. So I think what I'm hearing is that your epic life looks like being able to see that you are coming through in all of these like really different parts of your life from the minute details, which are really about expressing our love as a mom, like picking up Mm -hmm. a prescription, (laughs) something that most of us don't have on our calendar, you know, sitting down with George Clooney (laughs) to, to hold you know, that broad range of the different ways that your life is rich and meaningful. Yeah, that's, you know, and actually, while you were talking, I was realizing that, you know, going back to I had these buzz phrases, I think, especially during the time of my divorce to my first husband. And it was the inauthentic life, like I just didn't want to live an inauthentic life. And then, you know, this really old, tired phrase, this idea of having it all, but you know what? That's my version of having it all. Like what you just said is coming through. Yeah. 
Well, I want to now get into the epic guidepost. So as you know, epic is this larger metaphor for how we live our life. But then also it's an acronym mnemonic for the guideposts that I think help us live that life, especially when we're raising our children. And the first guidepost E stands for engaged, and it's about being engaged mindfully with our children. So I would love to hear how you're doing that in your life. One last thing before we move on, when you talked about that pillow that you saw at the thrift store, and that's a flashback to a pillow that you had on your bed growing up, that was also needlepoint. And I'm wondering if you remember what the message was. Yes, my mother had made me a needlepoint pillow, or I think she probably had just made it when I was born. It said, Tuesday's child is full of grace. Oh, right. And that pillow sits in Simone's room. Mm. Yeah. What meaning do you make from that message for yourself? Well, I was just born on a Tuesday. (laughs) Um, Maybe you didn't know. There's a whole thing. Monday's child is fair of face. (laughs) Tuesday's child is full of grace. Blah, blah, blah. So I can't take a whole lot of, I don't think my family could take any credit for that one. Although I have to say, as I've gotten older, the word grace, Uh it's one of my favorite words. And I do love to give compliments with that word when it's appropriate, because I think living life with grace is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. And clearly that pillow meant something to you because you've held on to it all these years. It had that prominent place on your bed. and now- That's right. <laughs> it's true. That's funny. Yeah, no, I do. I, well, it's either that or the needle point. You know, I love everything vintage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let's move on. Let's dig into the first guidepost E. Mm-hmm. What are the ways in which you feel like you engage mindfully with your children? So I think as my children have gotten older, it's been easier to engage mindfully. First of all, you know, and anyone who knows me, that is not my strong suit. Mindfulness and meditation and all those crazy, wonderful things that just escape me. It's just not my strong suit. I don't have a quiet brain and don't have the time to retrain it to be quiet. And I have not properly prioritized retraining my brain (laughs) to be more quiet. So it's just not my strong suit. However, when you ask me that question, I actually do understand it and I can answer it in the right way because it's really clearing out a lot of noise. It's really, for me, it's a focus. So I take that word mindfulness and I apply it to, am I really focused on what I'm doing with my children in that moment? And, or even more so for me, it's about being in the moment again, in the past, hasn't been my strong suit. Part of it is it was really bad when I knew I was not living my authentic life and I'm much better at it now. I'm happy to say And so in terms of my children, as they've gotten older, it's been much easier because the needs are more clear. Their needs are more specific. And that is much easier for me, having had a child growing up with some special needs, you know, areas of executive functioning, for example, or some focus or anything sensory. I always felt very bothered by the sensory stuff because it was so gray. There was so little black and white to it. It used to drive me really crazy. But now that their needs are more specific, it's easier. So Max just feels like homework was simply invented to torture him. And so now when I'm, it's not just about sitting next to him and having him feel the most at ease that he can while he's doing his homework, I feel very engaged with helping him come up with strategies. And so, you know, a couple of days ago, I realized that the way his math is being presented to him, they want him to show his work, but they provide no space for him to show that work. They sort of want him to cram it into the margins on the worksheet. I was like, this is crazy. Like for a kid like this with some of these issues. And it was as simple as stapling 
some extra blank sheets to the back of the workbook for math. But it's the fact that my brain was sort of clear and clean enough to focus on it and work with him to come up with a pretty simple solution. But that's a very good example of feeling that engagement. I'm proud of it. (laughs) I'll take that. And, you know, so with Simone, she's such an incredible child. She's challenging and she's brilliant. It has required to create more harmony in the family. There's language that has to be used. So more recently, you know, to help in sort of a moment where she's having, you know, a less logical sort of dysregulated emotional mood moment, you know, to remember that even in my frustration and in my lack of patience and almost, I just want there to be harmony in the house. Let's, you know, rush to get to the peace. Mm. You have to stop and remember to say, you know, the therapist recently suggested using language like, okay, Simone, you know, now you can, you have two paths that you can choose and, you know, one path you know, might make everybody feel better faster. And the other path is really going to cost you a lot of energy and that kind of thing. And I think having to be mindful in those moments and I have to choose, I have to choose to recall that information in my brain to deliver it to her, which in turn helps her. And then in turn helps the family, which in turn helps me. (laughs) Yeah. That's funny. Speaking of meditation, I'm in the middle of this 21 day Oprah and Deepak free meditation experience. Of course you are. (laughs) (laughs) And the other day, Deepak said in his like soothing voice, this quote that there is no way peace is the way. And that story with Simone is making me think about that and how I can channel that too in my relationship with Jake, who we have often laughed, you know, mirrors Simone in many ways, you know, to remember that when he is being that way, to try to tap into more of a sense of calm myself. Yeah, it will. And I, I know, I mean, it seems so basic, but in the moment, you're like, if I just yell loud enough, she's going to get quieter. And, you know, that really doesn't work. Should we tell your listeners about when we went away for the weekend with our moms and the book choices that we brought to our hotel room? (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think... It's funny because when I brought up the meditation, you're like, of course you are. Yes. You were highlighting, you know, the ways in which you and I are different in many ways. And it's, you know, so ironic in some ways that we've been such good friends for so many years and, you know, one best friend in high school because, (laughs) you know, we do approach things in a different way. So, yeah, what was your memory about that? So my memory, which still makes me giggle, and I do tell the story. So our mom's weekend with our actual moms and showing up to our hotel room and putting our respective books on the nightstand, yours where your bed was and mine on the other side. And your books, remind me, your books were... I think I was reading at the time, Big Magic from Elizabeth Gilbert, which ended up being a pivotal book for me in this whole... (laughs) path I've been on. That's exactly right. And I had the like fourth 50 shades of gray. <laughs> and it really, I think we have a picture of it. Just really, yes. it really captured it, didn't it? <laughs> it really did. And we had a really good laugh about it. And what I think is interesting though, is that, so yes, of course, like our choice of books, each of us was so different and so classically, you know, ours. And I don't know that many people necessarily that, you know, the first thing they do when they arrive in their hotel room is to unpack their book and put it by their bedside table. Yeah. There is this thing that you and I both have about loving to be engrossed, you know, reading, learning, connecting to a story or an idea that helps us, you know, connect to some part of ourselves in our life. Well, well, there are commonalities too. There are, there are. I'll compliment you. I think that you are really like a sponge and the way that you are in your life, you really do love to learn, love to learn about people 
And you take in information in a pretty spectacular way. I, on the other hand, probably was just reading the book for escapism. <laughs> but we'll just, we, I do think that we have all the right similarities to be such good friends. <laughs> yes. But you know what else you also unpacked? And you might not remember this. You also unpacked whatever scripts you were reading. Oh, yeah. I mean, you are always in the midst of finding stories, figuring out how to tell a story. And I want to use that as a way to move into the next guidepost P, which stands for passionate and purposeful. And this is about the impact that you're making in the world beyond your family. How would you describe the way that you are making an impact? Well, this is the easy one. So I'm very passionate about my work. I feel extremely lucky to be able to do what I do. Yes, I can okay, I've worked hard to get here and I'll take that. And it's really great. And, you know, I can pat myself on the back for that. But I have realized more recently that if I'm not going to fundraise and I'm not going to march, although we did march recently, that I am supposed to be telling stories. And, you know, for example, Dallas Fires Club, which is certainly the great honor of my career at this point. But you know, there's a law in Colorado, a big pharma law called the Dallas Buyers Club law. And that's impactful to know that a movie can make a difference. You know, granted, that's obviously a true story. So I do gravitate toward true stories. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, if you really don't celebrate the past, highlight the past, examine the past, especially when it's horrific, as our country has plenty of that, or the world certainly, you know, you're sort of destined to make the same mistakes going forward. So I am a big believer. So I do love true stories. And I think it's a great way to share with the generations that would otherwise have no connection to the things that have come before. But then most importantly, my job is to entertain because I don't want to preach. I don't want to be preachy. I want to find a way to tell important stories, but, you know, just stories that have something to say. You know, I'm doing the LeBron James movie at Universal, and that's, you know, a really wonderful way to reach an entirely different demographic than, say, Dallas Fires Club. And at its heart, it's really just a story about loyalty and friendship and destiny. And it's all true. And, you know, he has an incredible story. And, you know, that's a good example how there are so many disparate stories out there. So I do feel like that's my job. And so I'm just, I am naturally passionate about finding those stories and telling them. Yes. So before we move on to the next guidepost, I wonder what are one or two of the stories that you are on a quest to bring us, you mentioned the LeBron one, but maybe one or two others that you feel like will really be leaving the legacy that you want in terms of your impact? Well, I have a movie, it hasn't been announced yet, so I'm just going to talk about it in a very general sense, but it's a Holocaust movie. It's a true story. It starts in 1942, so it's toward the end of the war and set in outside of Prague. And a group of boys who were deeply affected by, you know, mid-20s young man who came in and just sort of said, we're not going to live like animals. We're going to have art and we're going to have culture because one day there won't be a war and we need to go on. It's very much in the vein of like a dead poet society, mm. a film that we loved growing up. And so I'm doing that. And then a couple things in television. And, you know, it's interesting. There's also a movie that Terry and I are doing at Paramount. We're doing the Evil Knievel story. And I'm evil, you know, I wasn't a 13-year-old boy who tried to ride my bike off the <laughs> roof with a cape. You know, I, yeah, I don't really care about that. But what I'm so fascinated by is how we elected Donald Trump as our president. And how did we get here? And when you look back at Evil Knievel, for example, it becomes very clear what we as a country are susceptible to. And so there's great history in it, where we were at the time with Vietnam, et cetera, and the need for a hero, a need for something crazy and so different to shake things up. So anyway, that's another example. 
of how I get connected to stories and why I get interested in them. Let's move on to the next guidepost I. The stands for invested in yourself. What are the ways that you take care of yourself, fill yourself with the things that bring you fulfillment and joy? And what are the things that you do to learn and grow? You know, it's such a good question. It's just great that that question even exists for women. (laughs) I'm actually getting better about it. It's pretty basic stuff, but I go to the gym, but I do it kind of with a, in a ritualistic way. After I drop the kids off, I go and I get my favorite cup of tea and I bring that with me to the gym. And I like to watch the news while I'm like, you know, on a treadmill and it does really feel like something I'm just doing for myself. I know I need to be healthy but it's the way I've approached it that I'm happy that I do take that time because it's so easily something that can fall off a cliff. And it extends beyond that. I try to take care of myself, meaning that I, when people want to schedule a conference call at nine, you know, depending on the traffic from when I'm dropping off max, I won't be able to get to my 30 minutes at the gym. And so I'm not scheduling those calls. I think when I was younger, I, it was the need to take any offer that was given to me. Somebody wants to have a conference call with me. I'll just schedule it based on their schedule. I know it sounds stupid, but it's a little bit of a self-worth issue. And I feel like I've kind of come to the other side of it. Like, if you want to have that call with me, you're going to have to wait. (laughs) And it's taken a lot for me to get there. Maybe it's not really going to the gym. It's about carving out a little bit of that time that I like. And you know me, I'm the wussiest of all worker outers. This is not, you know, I'm not doing too much, but it's more about carving it out. I'm getting a little more vain in my old age. I, you know, try to take care of my skin in a more committed way. You know, just, I guess stuff like that was interesting. There's a mom and pop little nail salon that I've always liked going to. And they had a little mutiny where half of the folks left and took half her clients. And she opened this shop 17 years ago and we used to go in there. And now I feel like I want to support the owner because she had something bad happen to her. So I I now become this like sort of 50s style woman where I have an appointment (laughs) to go and get a manicure more like once a week. And it's really connected. I just want to support this local businesswoman. It's a very strange thing. But anyway, my nails certainly look better for it. Yeah. You know, before we took ourselves off video for this interview, I noticed how beautiful your nails look. Well, thank you very much. It's all from Lisa. But I do. I really appreciate this. Just you know, realizing that investing in time for yourself is important, actually carving out the space and having boundaries and being willing to say no when other things will take away that, you know, kind of a sacred commitment to yourself. Yes. And I, for me, part of it is this written list that I'm staring at as we speak, but I can do it as long as I remain organized, because I, you know, I don't balance the stress well. And so, you know, the reward for being organized isn't heaping on more. The reward for being organized is to be able to carve out and and put that investment back into yourself. Mm, That's really good. The last guidepost C stands for connected. And this is about all of the relationships that we nurture in our lives and where we find community so that we're not isolated while we're on our journey. Tell me about the relationships in your life and how you cultivate and nurture those. Well, that is a great question also. A lot of it is just simply being reduced to trying and making an effort and also jumping on a natural instinct. So I'll use an example that relates to both of us. So our dear friend, Karen, getting ready for her son's bar mitzvah. You know, we've been having a good time. I've been enjoying helping her get ready for this really important event in her life. Um, I don't really have 
time to be like, you know, going online and finding pashminas or shawls for the guests because she's very worried about the fact that she has it outside and will her guests be warm enough? And I can feel how stressed she is about it. So I have this natural instinct to try and help her. And so I did. I found the solution for her. And, you know, we argued about her dress. I wanted it to, you know, look a certain way. So I sent her a tailor to her house because, you know, I know that her strong suits aren't necessarily like we were just talking about taking care of herself or necessarily putting herself first. And so I use this as an example of I'm nurturing my relationships by following up on any instinct I have to share my time to lean really far into it. So where I can get lazy or not prioritize, I realize that these relationships, taking care of your friends, taking care of your family, that's what makes community. So you're part of the community by being more active. So active listening or I know where my strengths are. So I'm a creative person. My friend has a problem. She's worried about people being cold at her son's bar mitzvah. I can creatively help her come up with a solution. So I'm trying to work harder to follow those instincts and play to my strengths. And in turn, that's the way I can show love for people. Yeah, I feel that from you all the time. I'm thinking about me like you know, texting you pictures from the dressing room <laughs> of the different dresses I was looking at for Ryan's bar mitzvah. And I'm also thinking about the day that we spent with our friend Leslie when she was battling mm-hmm. pancreatic cancer. And I know you had a lot going on, but you were there for her that day, but you were there for her many, many days when I wasn't, you know, clearing time from your really busy schedule to be there for her. And I know you were such a great support to her. So that's something I really appreciate about you. Thanks, Jules. I appreciate, you know, I, you know, but I, and I, look, I've learned a lot from you and, you know, the closeness that you have with your sisters and your family has always been an inspiration to me. I didn't have a sister and, you know, so you and your sisters were sort of the closest thing. And, you know, I really, uh, I am realizing the older I get, it's not because, oh, time is moving so fast. It's really just, again, I think for me, it all comes down to a feeling of self-worth, being able to organize. For me, organization goes right into prioritization and it's really helping on all levels. So the more I feel like, okay, I'm worth A, B, and C, you realize how much joy you can get from helping other people. Yeah. I'd like to hear a little bit about your relationship with Terry, your husband, who is an incredibly talented, amazing screenwriter, and what it's like to work collaboratively with your life partner. Also, I'm wondering what it's like to share what I would call an epic snapshot moment, like both being at the Oscars together, both being nominated for an award together. Tell me about what that relationship is like. You know, my relationship with Terry is amazing. And in certain ways, I credit the epic nature of my life with having met him, fallen in love with him. And I think we're both two people who face the world the same way. So a little bit of that driven by F you, if you're going to tell me I can't do it. If you tell me I can't do it, I'm going to show you that I can. I think we're both a little bootstrap C. (laughs) And so we speak that same language. I think one of the strengths of our relationship is speaking the same unspoken language. So if we're with people and anything, you know, silly, you know, somebody's speaking with an affect or something like one glance at him. I know exactly what he's thinking and I'm going to get a whole show later. (laughs) And then working together, I think that we have the benefit of we met through work. So we met producer to writer. So he's used to giving to getting notes from me 
I don't know that that dynamic always works with a relationship. And I'm not even going to comment female to male, male to female, nothing to do with that. I'm just going to say that I think it's very, you know, what's the rule? The number one suspect in every murder is the spouse. (laughs) There's a reason (laughs) that married people drive each other absolutely nuts, but we work very well together. And part of it is probably just because that's how we met. And so it was a dynamic that we were both used to. And the being at the Oscars together was, it was so unforgettable to be able to share that with such equal footing. There was no care that needed to be given to the other person to make sure that they were okay. We were both being celebrated at the exact same time in the exact same way for hard work and talent. And it was extraordinary. I could not be more grateful for that experience and the way that it happened. Mm, I love that awareness about being on equal footing and both being celebrated in your own right. When you look back on that, is there a particular moment that feels etched in your memory that you'll never forget? I think it was probably stepping onto that red carpet. Neither one of us take that stuff for granted. We are still just kind of as starstruck by our heroes as we have ever been. And we've always said, you know, once you stop enjoying that kind of experience, just don't go. I mean, you know, don't go to something like that unless you genuinely have that smile on because you feel it. And so we sort of know how lucky we are. And so we do, we're very on par. So we probably, I think we stepped out onto that carpet and I, you know, I'm still like that goofy girl where like, I'm such a sucker for movie magic and I felt it. It all washed over me where it just felt, I felt the magic of being there. You know, it's a little bit of a little girl playing dress up because that's kind of what that evening is. is a bunch of people playing dress up. (laughs) So, but it was extraordinary. So it really was like hook, line, and sinker. Just it had me. Yeah. Well, we're at the towards the end of our conversation, and what's left is an opportunity for you to give me and anybody listening who wants to say yes a challenge, and then also for us to reflect on what we're taking away from the conversation. Okay. So I've been thinking about this and. I've been thinking about the fact that I think, you know, given that Crystal is coming out on April 13th, you know, all over the country, the feedback that I'm getting about the movie is that this is not a movie that fits easily into a box. This is a movie that's a little challenging because there's drama, there's humor. It's an affectionate look at addiction, which is obviously a huge issue in our country. And it's a very diverse film, the way that it's cast. And, you know, we have an African-American female lead and we have an African-American young man in a wheelchair. And it's just this wild, wacky ride. And at the premiere last night, the last thing I said was we wanted to make a poignant comedy that addresses the fact that we are not at our best when we're coming from a place of fear. And because that's one of the main themes of the movie and given our current political cycle, I think it became strangely relevant. So I was thinking that I'd like to challenge people to go to the movies, go see Crystal, embrace it as not something unexpected, be open to it, be open to laughing and thinking during one whole movie. And also I said at the end of my little speech last night, I said, look around at the person next to you, say hello, because we are all in this together. And we're really all we've got. (laughs) And I think that people are actually inspired to be better, to treat each other better and, you know, kind of embrace something that people haven't embraced in a long time. And thanks to the crazy person in the Oval Office, I think people are really I don't know, almost excited to meet that challenge. So I don't know. My challenge is go see an out-of-the-box movie that isn't like anything else, diverse. So go see the movie and 
look around while you're there and take in the people that are, let's hope, next to you (laughs) (laughs) and take a moment to remember that we are all in it together. Okay, so the challenge is to go see the movie Crystal and to really take it in as a unique out-of-the-box experience. And while doing that, to really look around at the people in all of our differences, actually connect with them and tap into this knowing that we are really all in this together. Exactly. Yes. Okay. I commit to doing that. I commit to bringing my son Ryan with me. Great. And we will do that together. And before we move on to the acknowledgements, I feel compelled in this moment also, Rachel, because you know me so well. To ask you, what is also one challenge you feel like you would like to give to me based on where you see me on my path to living my authentic movie version epic life? (laughs) I challenge you to put your money where your mouth is and to invest in yourself more than you currently do. Mm. Yeah. You're an amazing mother and a great wife, a crazy great daughter and sister. And I think that you've really, you've done it. You've jumped in with both feet into this mission. And, but I feel like you can push yourself more to take care of yourself. Yeah. Definitely. And I think it's okay that some of that falls into a superficial category. Okay. I commit. A few episodes ago, Carly Nemo was on talking about committing to these like five foundational commitments that you make to yourself, no matter what. And I've outlined them. And I feel like I could just bring a little bit more attention and focus to them. And I think also maybe switch them up a little bit so that I'm bringing some other kinds of self-care that might even be on the superficial side to that list from time Good. to time. Good. I like that. Thank you. Wow. Well, that went fast. It was such a pleasure to have you in this experience with me and have a deep conversation in a different way. I so appreciate you. And I feel like the themes that are jumping out at me that I will take with me from this conversation are living an authentic life, really paying attention to like checking in from time to time about like, okay, does this feel like the vision that I have for myself? And if it feels out of alignment, being courageous enough and believing in myself and my life enough to make, you know, some decisions and changes when needed. I'm thinking a lot about this word grace being more full of grace for myself and for my children and really carving out space, you know, for my own self-care, for my own mission and for a willingness to have it sometimes be outside of the box to not feel like it has to fit in somebody else's vision of what that should be. Thank you for all of those gifts from this conversation and from being able to be your friend alongside you in your life and see them coming into your life all the time. Thank you, Julie. I really enjoyed this. I had a great time and I'm so glad that we did this. Thank you for squeezing me in and I love you. You're an amazing woman. What do you feel like are the things that you're leaving this conversation with in terms of some kind of increased awareness something that's come into sharper focus for you? I'm definitely thinking about, we touched on it, but we didn't talk too much about it. And I think I'm just going to spend a little bit more time thinking about this cycle of life and the concept of everyone gets their turn that my children are sort of owed or do my love and focus as I received from my mother. And then it'll be on them to in turn, give that to their children. And I think that part of the responsibility really has to do with finding a balance because part of it is to 
be the example. And so it can't be this totally sort of selfless approach. And so the guilt that, you know, we sometimes want to heap on ourselves because it took me too long to figure out that I just needed to add an extra piece of scratch paper to the back of Max's math book list <laughs> instead of focusing on that guilt, just sort of being like, all right, well, it, you know, he gets a combo platter. My daughter gets a combo platter. Eventually I figure out to attach the scratch piece of paper to the back <laughs> of his booklet. But I also, you know, made an impact with some of my work last night and, you know, they had to think about me and they made me cards and so that balance is, the balance can be part of the cycle. Mm. And so I think I just need to, keep, you know, kind of keep thinking about that. And because that feels the most authentic to me in terms of being a mom, because I obviously not going to be a different kind of mom. I'm going to be the kind of mom that I am. <laughs> yes. so, yeah. And Tuesday's child is full of grace. Grace, I love you. Love you too, Jules. Thank Talk you. to you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about the Mother's Quest community, head over to mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review, and help us spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day, love your people, honor your gifts. Until next time.